John Kennedy was not the first to say that the Chinese character for crisis was made up of two Chinese characters, one meaning danger and the other meaning opportunity. But he's the one that made it popular. I personally heard it from Scott Peck, whose wife, Lily, was Chinese. Scott Peck really should have asked Lily about this, but he didn't ask her much. It, it isn't true, but it has a certain logical appeal. The characters that make up the word crisis in Chinese do, however, convey a certain sense of angst in the present moment. When you're standing right on the threshold of where something could get really screwed up. Things could change for the better, or things could change for the worse. And I think that's where we really are right now with this coronavirus. The virus takes place through just the mere circumstance of human events, but now it's been unleashed, and it's probably going to be a part of our medical horizon forever. Right now, because we don't have a vaccine yet, it's causing markets to crash, capitalism, the free market, left to its own devices, will not save us this time. So things are going to change, and they're likely to change pretty dramatically and pretty quickly. And that change does simultaneously present us with some fantastic opportunities to make progress. We could make decisions right now that we should have made maybe a long time ago. But now, because as uh, AOC has said, you've poured gasoline on the crisis, now we might have the energy to actually do something about it. But progress doesn't come in on the wheels of inevitability, men and women. It could also screw up. When you trace the way civilizations have been running during the modern era, from absolute monarchs through feudalism, colonialism, slavery, industrialization, then combinations of socialism and capitalism, and, and now what we see is this fairly complicated blend of what I think we have to call tyranny with democracy, maybe oligarchy, but it starts to feel more like tyranny. There is a kind of socialist economy alive in the world that is married to a Darwinian capitalism. And we're seeing how each nation's unique types and blends of government authority of their economic distribution, how they manage their healthcare rationing, all of that is being put to the test with how they are surviving this pandemic. Yesterday, Italy had their largest number of deaths from the pandemic, and they have universal health care. So there are other issues afoot, and we see that in terms of ratios of uh, mortal cases, uh, deaths caused in China's population compared to the United States, that somehow China, if we can believe the numbers, is, are, is way ahead of us. So I took uh, AOC's tweet as our wisdom lesson today. I don't normally turn to Twitter for philosophy, but when it's AOC, I will make an exception. She really is one of the bright spots on the American political horizon right now. But I believe that she's right on the mark with these comments. The occurrence of a world-threatening pandemic suddenly introduces us to an existential moment. And in that crisis, we stand on a precipice. And suddenly, the status quo has collapsed forever. We will never go back to the way things were in February, at least as we have been distracted by that status quo. That has stopped. We don't eat out now, we don't go to bars, we don't go to theaters, we don't go to retail shops. And now even if you go to the pharmacy or the grocery store, you may literally be risking your life. In this environment, the problems that have plagued our society are now brought into much sharper view. With the failure to have some kind of working universal health care, and now the lack of employment or income guarantees, and what do those hundreds of thousands of people around our country do 
when they are told to stay home when they do not have a home? How do you quarantine in place if you've got no house, you've got no food, you've got no income, you've got no money, and you have no health care? What AOC means by carceral is the whole universe of incarcerated people. You've been hearing me um, bemoaning the family separation policy. Bemoaning was the nicest word I could think of at the time. <laughs> the child separation policy in which we are literally caging tens of thousands of children uh, on our border through ICE. But what about those kids now? Now when we're supposed to be staying separate from each other. Now when the prospect of just having a church service or attending a live music event could get thousands of people deathly sick. What do you think that virus is doing in the detention centers? And honestly, it's almost like the web has been scrubbed clean of information about them. Where are they? How many of them are there? In 2008 and 2009, I mean, or 2018 and 2019, we knew. Now ICE tells us that they've got 37,000 people in, in detention centers. How many of them are children? And if you wanted to go protest, where would you go? Amy Goodwin with uh, Democracy Now! recently interviewed the former director of ICE, the guy that was there during the Obama administration, John Sandwich, and he's published an article in The Atlantic, which <laughs> my editors never let me make up my own titles, but this, this is a title that's a showstopper. It's titled, I used to run ICE, we need to release the nonviolent detainees. It's the only way to protect detention facilities and the people in them from COVID-19. I've written articles shorter than that, but the title is very descriptive of the situation. You think the virus spread on cruise ships quickly. Imagine how it's going to spread in here. How do you keep the virus from not infecting 100% of those people that are crowded up against each other? And the media has been indignant with Florida's governor for allowing spring breakers to congregate on Florida's beaches, which you got to say, that's dumb. In fact, it's like only nine people in the room, but you can say it, that was dumb. That was dumb. Okay, thank you. See, I'm not alone. You all think I have no friends. I've got eight friends. <coughs> but those kids were there on their own free will, and the media has been all but silent about these kids in the detention centers who are living in squalid, crowded conditions in cages and not just for spring break. They've got no soap with which to wash their hands. They rarely get to shower. The, the conditions are unsanitary. And you know what else? They're not there forever. They're there for three, four months, and then they're released. Where do they go? Where do they go when they are shedding the virus? What happens then? And we've been talking here for years about the two million Americans in prisons and jails. I would love to show you a picture of inside the Green County Jail right now, but I can't. You know why? Because you can't go in there. As a clergyman, I can't go in there. If you've got an immediate family member, you cannot visit them in person. No one's allowed to visit in the jail anymore. But you know, they have been putting three and four people in two-person cells four years. Two sleep on the bunks, one sleeps on the floor, and one sleeps sitting up on the toilet. Now, how are they going to keep from spreading COVID-19 in the Greene County Jail? Our incarceration system, men and women, it is a nuclear bomb of virus waiting to go off anytime in the next month or two. And all the efforts that we've gone through in social distancing and washing our hands and sterilizing doorknobs and toilet handles and, and cell phones, what does that mean if two million people in incarcerated situations come down with this virus and then they're released into the public? Now, this is not a hypothetical. As of Wednesday of this week, prisoners in Los Angeles, 
in San Francisco, in Leesburg, Georgia, in Wapun, Wisconsin, in Oakdale, Louisiana. They have prisoners in all those places that have already tested positive for the virus. In New York, on Rikers Island, today, there's more than 30 people involved in the New York City correction system who've tested positive, including Harvey Weinstein. And I know you all would love for me to riff on that, but I'm not gonna. We have needed massive criminal justice reform in this country for 40 years. But our evil practice, and I don't mind using the word evil, I'm a theologian, our evil practice of caging human beings as if they were animals is gonna come back and bite the whole society with a potentially uncontrolled spread of the virus. It's been a moral blight on America for two generations, but now they're gonna fight back. And they're gonna fight back simply by spreading a virus. Now, throughout our country, states, municipal governments are shutting down all but essential businesses during this crisis. But locally, gun shops are considered to be essential. Gun shops. The insanely lax gun laws we have somehow endured as 40,000 Americans, including toddlers, like this three-year-old who died in my, near my ancestral home in Lexington, Kentucky last week when he shot himself in the head. We have lived with laws that allow 40,000 people a year to die of gunshot wounds. And I can almost hear the father in this case saying, well, I didn't know it was loaded. Or I always kept that up where the kids couldn't get at it. And now here in Springfield, our local gun shops are setting records for sale of ammunition as our neighbors are all arming themselves in anticipation of what? The toilet paper wars in, in Springfield? Our gun addiction is not just stupid, it's evil, and it's evil because it's lethal. We should have changed them years ago like every other developed country, but we have to change them now. Men and women, our society has come um, to a point where we have to recognize that it's not just COVID-19 that's making us sick. We've been sick for a long time. We are at a crossroads where we're either going to have to make some very important decisions in short order or we're going to let our negligence run over us. And I got to tell you, our first round of decisions have not exactly filled me with hope. Recognizing what an extended shutdown of the marketplace would do to their population, Canada, Canada immediately decided to send $2,000 a month to every adult in Canada for four months. Imagine what that says to the marketplace, that, that there's going to be business for them, even if they're closed right now, that there's going to be an ability to buy and pent up business when they are able to unlock their doors. England voted to pay 80% of every unemployed person's salary during the layoffs. Denmark voted to pay slightly less, 75%, while the United States voted to give over a trillion dollars in bailouts to corporations and to give its citizens a one-time incentive of $1,200. So you want to know what the difference is between Darwinian capitalism and democratic socialism? This is a pretty good example. Right now, in spite of the weather, wouldn't you rather be living in Canada? In this aid package, the Senate had the Congress absolutely over a barrel. They had to agree to the largest transfer of wealth to the top 1% in the history of our country because they had to vote to give this small bit of aid to the poor and the middle class. The people of this nation are literally being held economic hostage by the corporate control of our government. But we can see, at least by contrast, what the difference is between a country that saves its people first in a time of crisis and a country that saves airlines, hotels, and the cruise ship industry in a time of crisis. Suddenly, Medicare for all just doesn't sound all that crazy, does it? A universal basic income seems almost necessary 
certainly more necessary than maintaining. You've, you, everyone keeps saying, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? Right now, what we are paying for is 800 military bases in 70 countries, some of which were established so that we could win World War II, which, as best I can tell, has been over for 80 years. And so all we have to do is pull in our military spending and start spending on human beings. I might be wrong about this, but I don't think so. So who's going to save America in the middle of this Medicare crisis? Will it be the executives at Boeing, at American Airlines, at Hilton Inns? You know they're not going to do it. Now, they are about to give themselves big bonuses out of your pocket. But who stands between us and death? Who stands between us and utter social chaos? Nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, the EMS workers. And you know who else? The guys who still come around and pick up our garbage once a week and those low-waged employees who are risking their lives to restock grocery store shelves, and the kid at the drive-in window at Sonic and McDonald's. Those are the people that we need to recognize that even though our culture has said for a generation that they don't deserve a living wage, they do. They are saving our lives and we need to save theirs. Now, before I close today, I also want to add that this crisis will end. Now, it's not gonna end by Easter, and it may not end for several months, but the ultimate solution is a vaccine, and a vaccine typically takes one or two years to develop, but we have a head start on this one and we have a head start thanks to research that was being done in laboratories in China because their government-funded laboratories recognized that rather than coming up with a new ED pill, that they knew that there would eventually be a pandemic and it would probably be a derivation of the coronavirus. And so they have been doing the genetic sequencing necessary to prepare a vaccine. And they have then shared that information with American laboratories. There is a laboratory in Boston that this weekend has begun testing on laboratory animals of a vaccine. There are as many as 35 research centers in America working on both treatments and vaccines. And currently, scientists are actually sharing information with each other as if money wasn't the most important thing in the world. In short, I think we have to consider that there are upsides to having had this virus strike. And one of them is that people around the globe are starting to act like they always should have acted. As wicked as this $2 trillion relief bill was, I personally find some solace in the fact that our Senate voted 96 to zero I've been trying to find the last time that happened, and I can't find that information available anywhere. Our Senate, actually, this body of self-serving plutocrats that, that in a normal week couldn't agree whether the sun should come up in the east or not, they reached a unanimous decision, and that needs to be applauded. Now, that doesn't mean the battle has been won, but it does mean this. It means the battle can be won, that there is a moral baseline where Republicans and Democrats can actually act like grown-ups, and I find that to be encouraging. I want to ask you to do a few things today. I want you to compliment the staff at the grocery store, from the checkout cashier to the kid that's putting stock back up on the shelves. And when you go to the pharmacy, I want you to thank everyone you talk to. And I want to suggest that you tip the kid at the drive through window, even at McDonald's. And find a way to help support gig workers like musicians, 
Uber drivers, and everyone who's now unemployed. Use your imagination about now getting some work done on your house or your vehicle, something that you can pay someone for to help them to keep body and soul together. And while I'm talking about it, you might remember even to support your favorite clumsy, corpulent cleric. But at the same time, be kind to everyone you meet because they are just as worried as you are. Be at peace, my friends. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.